Okay, this response and comment and opinion is going to be slightly embarrassing of myself because um, uh, because what I'm critiquing is, I think, a bit intellectually dishonest and, and slightly nascent in its construction of its sophisticated, contemplative, nuanced, philosophical uh, structure, I guess. And, and that... Um, that will make it tricky to deal with and appear to attend to all the facets that they are that they, that, that they are that they are outlining as salient but they're actually not so salient and in some sense there is a there is a there's a there's a false moral paradigm that that these contemplative objects are being placed inside of and in some sense i think that that, that paradigm itself is fundamentally corrupt and, and this is rooted in how Google went off the rails. And I know that this person, I don't know his particular history, has left Google. But I, I think that he actually still suffers from some of the core, the core deviation, which then he maybe wasn't happy in terms of how it continued to mutate and adapt and, and metastasize. But... But I think he's still on the wrong track. So I'm, I'm going to try and outline uh, s some of these issues. And, and in some sense, and, and I'm going to, I'm, this is going to make me seem like an idiot. And it's going to be, see, I'm going to look, this is going to be embarrassing if I start off by just starting off with my general prescription as to what kind of solves these problems before you even get into them. That the, the real genius in, in being ethical in this context is to avoid the major problems and to be humble in some sense and not um, and not to think that you can manage and tend to these things that, that, that you can you can say yes the, you're dealing with consciousness you're dealing with agency and you're dealing with a collective consciousness or something like that and you have to be responsible to the, to the collective consciousness that is a recipe for disaster because then essentially you, you are assigning yourself as a kind of architect um, that's going to mold society in some sense through the kind of the the um, through a kind of interle interlocking process that's seen as is that's reduced into just a sort of a mere mechanism, and because you've got kind of statistical readings as to how essentially that's going to produce general tendencies, and you want a good outcome of a of a new set of general tendencies that however you are you going to preference those those markers however are you going to diagnose that this is the right mix and that's the wrong mix and that is exactly the kind of field which which the interviewee on rebel wisdom was essentially toying with and and actually that's where his contemplative paradigm is is the idea is that well these things have to be architected some in some way and so they need to be architected in a kind of in, a, in, a, in an ethically positive way where these things are being tended to in a, in a proactive, pro-social uh, project and, and design. That is, that is like the world controllers of Brave New World in some sense as well. And, and, the, and I think that his general excuse as to why you have to be in that mind space, why you have to actually philosophically contend on that level with that problem is, is a false dilemma, is a fundamentally false sort of uh, a problem which he poses, which is, is that you are going to be redirecting attention at some point. Therefore, you might as well see yourself as doing it uh, prescriptively and, and mold that prescription to be pro-social or to be positive or, or some, some definition of ethical po po positivity. And that whole formulation is just fundamentally problematic. Okay, uh, the, 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 the actual solution to this was actually in the original motto of Google, which was don't be evil. This was corrupted when they changed the Google ethos, essentially, to interpret don't be evil as don't do evil. So when they said don't do evil, nothing we do must be ethically even neutral 
or negative. It must be ethically positive. And therefore, we actually have to have an image of what the ethically positive outcome is that we are targeting. This is, this is fundamentally what... Uh, now, let me just describe, let's say, what, what an alternative paradigm would be, which would avoid all of these problems. Is that as a platform, as any kind of curated space or whatever, or, or that's infused with algorithms or whatever, allow your platform to have a characteristic, to have, to have a character, to have a design space that 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 has a certain feeling and and even i would say that it's good if those things are um are consistent on some technical level and, and this is this is problematic because it's hard to define what i'm saying but i think as long as in some sense the algorithms are general purpose algorithms and they're fundamentally agnostic as to the content that they're dealing with fine let the platform take on the character that that manifests from from such a, a setup it's up to people to 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 move to platforms that that are that have different characteristics that have different features in some sense uh, the idea that there's no alternative to someone else directing the attention or to or to let's say um, brokering the filtration system in how people are uh, fed into um, information or, 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 or okay, I'm really sounding like a fumbling idiot, but um, uh, okay, L let me just redraw some of this stuff. So I'm, I'm slightly annoyed with myself because I posted a very long comment to a TED talk I think it was in 2016 or 2017 by this lady, which is probably might have been the lady that he was referring to in the interview. And I basically had a very good answer to this, to this whole thing. I mean, uh, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm slightly annoyed that I don't have that sort of to reference because that that sort of essay actually I think sort of uh, fundamentally encapsulated that this is not a problem in some sense in some sense it's good that people are being trapped by their own let's say def deficient characters into even self flagellating or self you know sub suboptimal experiences wonderful after that pattern plays itself out, then perhaps they will move to a different space, that they will choose a different, um, you know, in as much as that people can be played by algorithms and things like that and um, toyed with or, or something like that, I think it's good as long as it's consistent, as long as, as, long as the, the, that trick that's being played against them or whatever is a consistent external force i'm happy with it because that that is how things eventually level up that is how things eventually uh, um, that's how consciousness eventually expands is is by pattern recognition and so as long as that whatever treatment they're being treated by a platform is consistent i mean i'm actually uh i think it's great i think it's going to be a wonderful engine of of um awareness um, because in some sense a lot of those sorts of things don't even come to the picture unless they're happening to a people a group of people that are experiencing the same kind of conditioning as it were because then you've got a pocket that sort of creates a kind of a subculture experience which then can be referenced which then is it's easier to point at as as a phenomena and so it actually makes it easier for um more people to to come to realizations because they essentially are doing it through a kind of group or collective sort of uh, shared experience uh, and and they can pool their experience with each other and um, really experience the nature of their let's say uh, uh, niche that that they are occupying within a kind of uh, uh, consistent um,
or regu uh, uh, an ongoing and persistent. So, so, but okay, so so obviously there there might be better there might be platforms that are better than other other platforms, and for those platforms to even emerge, and for even and and to and to distinguish themselves as being a different option uh, to the existing ones. I think the, the, the pathological patterns have to actually become instantiated. You have to, in some sense, sit with the, um, I mean, your people, their attention is being farmed. Wonderful. Because when people realize that their attention is being gamed, uh, then they'll, for the first time ever, perhaps, become responsible for that. Now, the idea that, like, that, the platform is going to treat your attention as sacred for you and is going to sort of already sort of inculcate that that context that your attention is sacred. That would be very dangerous because essentially then if that's going to be encoded into the platform and it's not going to be, let's say, chosen by the um, participant in some sense, but it's going to sort of be infused into the platform. I mean, that's going to be baked into a whole many subset of layers of, of perhaps even ideological inception and things like that. Um, I think it's, it's much better if these things are somewhat organic um, and people are, are curating them for themselves. People are um, and in some sense I think that that kind of half-baked solution, I, th I think I, I can see elements of that is in the is, is sort of in the, in the attitude and in the um, I mean, uh, you know, like, uh, excuse me for being triggered by essentially these narratives or whatever. But I mean, it, it's, I, I, I it, it wasn't just me. There, there was this, this, I don't know if, if it was just sort of given as, as a strange sort of example, but there was this, this very disgusting insinuation that Alex Jones was a racist. That was Alex Jones w w was, a, was a broadcaster or, or a, um, an amplifier of, of racist sentiments, some bullshit like that, uh, to, to sort of, to excuse his, his censorship and his removal from the YouTube platform in some sense. And sort of un, under this general sort of thing that, well, people have a certain amount of attention and platforms are going to sort of amplify people organically within their system and so they are going to be amplifying the attention that is fed to certain sources of information. And because essentially there's only so much attention that people have, that that has to be done with some kind of ethical, that has to be done in terms of some kind of ethical curatorship of the platform or a system. Yeah, I mean, this this is, um, I mean, you can see how this sort of creates a kind of gated bubble reality of a kind of echo chamber from which there is no escape. It would be, I think, better to be deluded by con conspiracy theories and things like that and to have people wade through these things. Um, and yeah, I mean, this this sort of cop out of oh no the, the solution is not more free speech because there isn't enough attention to go around this is all very sort of a weird kind of cynical i mean the idea that oh no no oh they they're being more sophisticated and more nuanced uh, uh that they're dealing with philosophical issues which are more important those philosophical issues are not are only relevant to the um, to let's say the the uh, the the design ethos of designing the platform. They are not relevant to um, the justice that is served to the participants in the platform of of having let's say access to certain sources of information just cut out and denied them. 
the, uh, and, 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 and participants are censored in the spread of uh, uh, freedom of speech. Is, is, are you, are we can just throw that all under the bus, under some sort of basic, disgusting heuristic that, oh, well, there isn't enough attention in, in someone's life so it, it's okay to censor people. I mean, it is, and, and the idea that you can sort of limit, I mean, perhaps, you know, okay, so you, you're going to cut people out of the algorithm. You're going to say, I mean, in some sense that the whole platform is designed in order to grab people's attention, but then we're going to um, flag some things as, as too problematic from an ethical standpoint, uh, uh, so we're going to cut the, them out of, of the sort of of the merry-go-round of feeding, feeding you as, as a suggestion to other people. Um, the, I mean, you know, how how would you ever? design a, a solid platform uh, how would you ever structure that in, in a platform I mean, you, what you'd have tiers you, you would sort of have a kind of qualitative um, rating on content and and sort of put it into into sort of five star four star three star two star and um, and then perhaps have an ideological star rating in terms of let's say I mean how would you even make a sort of canonical categorization of what is ethically problematic in some sense you know so you're really sort of you're, you're really curating heavily in in the field of in the domain of of ideas and, and philosophy in some sense and uh and in some sense i, I think I, I all i wonder you know so i mean because this person a lot of his ideas that i that i heard it was basically the Foucault, the Foucault version of of um, sort of the, the. I don't even know what sort of headings to put on it, but but the kind of on on the production of knowledge as being a political, as being a fundamental, fundamental you know, uh, political process of. Um, of power and and systems and it seemed to me very uh, interested in in sort of playing that um, that mediating role and that role of arbiter over these kinds of these layers of, of political um, systems of knowledge and knowledge communities um, and trying to to bring it under the yoke of some kind of canonical ethical paradigm this is not possible you know if there if there's going to be another if there's going to be a competing platform to youtube let's just say that is going to perhaps have a a pay model that you you pay to belong to it and you can post whatever you want and there's no advertising and essentially, suggestions are based on correlational relevance. You know that they have the same kind of associative um, algorithms that YouTube has, but they um, perhaps they have a more sophisticated system of rating. That you don't just give content five stars; you can sort of rate it within multiple dimensions perhaps that you, you you can rate something five stars for a kind of overall production quality of sort of entertainment and then you can sort of rate it in, in terms of its substance in terms of a kind of an, an intellectual contribution or a kind of insightfulness you know you just have to come up with with sort of with with uh, words that have their own sort of distinct like three or four dimensions or words that have their own sort of distinct kind of flavor of of mix of of sort of why something would be pertinent or salient to to be um commendable to make the con content commendable in a particular dimension and then essentially based on that kind of commendation um uh rating system 
you would have a more sophisticated way of um, brokering uh, dialogue and debate and discussion. Um, and um, you know, so there might be sort of other ways of, of doing it. Um, And obviously, in the kind of in the context of cheap commercialism, YouTube is run the way it's run because it's just sort of uh, the inmates start running the asylum because um, they have to kind of put some nice window dressing on a uh, uh, what is effectively a, a money making. Um, enterprise and essentially also the biggest problem of YouTube is like all other enterprises that have fallen to this woke, racist, sexist, you know, sort of um, ideological capture is um, that, you know, in an overarching way, it, it is incentivized to function as a kind of, as a functional psychopath. And, you know, it's sort of, and it, and it has to, as a psychopath has to put up a mask, it has to pretend to uh, conform to certain values and ethics. And so the most superficial kind of ethics then become... Uh, become the sort of the the obvious kind of candidate because virtue signaling is is very pliable is very useful for that kind of um semblance of of sort of keeping your brand responsible in some social adjective way um And it can just bend to the window dressing of the, of the, of, and in some sense, you know, the biggest problem that this is, is that no ordinary people, they want access to platforms, but essentially they don't want to pay for the use of the service, essentially. I mean, you can, you can label everything as a problem in society is because of the public at large is not organized, doesn't have strong structures, doesn't have institutional integrity that it has invested in because it just wants it for free and so obviously these institutions are fundamentally captured i mean this is an overarching theme that people are just i mean and even if they were it's hard to establish authentic trust it's hard to like get something that actually has real fidelity that conserves a real fiduciary duty to the people who who utilize it it's very hard to keep trust alive and to keep it authentic in some sense and genuine and, you know, it's always prone to being captured. Sometimes it's not even captured by money interests. It's just captured by people that get into the institution who just don't have an ethical framework that they are capable of, of keeping the system functioning because they're a bit stupid. They're a bit daft, essentially. And so they just, they capitulate to, to uh, superficial morality systems and they fall in with the, with the general psychopathy that, that you know, general corporations and capitalism uh, um, lean toward sort of as, as a natural um, facilitator of, of how it, it, it passes itself off as, as, uh, as sanitizing its brands. So we've, we've got all of these tendencies that are already sort of in the mix. Um, and in some sense, I, I would say that the problem that society generally has at large is that the public is just not willing to pay for trust, for authenticity, you know, it's like they, they don't, you know, put your money where your mouth is, pay for the authentic journalism, pay for the, you know, like, if, if you want clean politics, you actually have to donate to political parties, in some sense, you have to, you have to find a way to fund the people to keep them independent from the system, 
but because no one wants to pay a politician when they lose. You know, imagine being a polit. I mean, this is the biggest problem that politics has: is that the losers of a race are unemployed. They don't. They don't get a salary from the state. So it's very hard to be in politics unless you can guarantee that you will always win every election. And if you don't win every election, you have to be able to support yourself. So you can just see that already then politics is almost destined to be married to big money. Because there's nothing you can do as a loser. You know, if they had a second, if they had a shadow parliament or a, a, a shadow congress that kind of facilitated itself as a kind of as a, as a think tank to generate policy and, and policy debate and policy critique and its own kind of you know elections of shadow cabinet or something like that and its own internal processes to kind of supplement a kind of political commentary within the general public discourse you know then you would perhaps have a, a, a wider or a broader dimension for um, for a more vibrant uh, 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 what's the word engaged real politic or whatever um, but the system is somewhat designed to be captured and people aren't willing to effectively pay to have it uncaptured um, and this is the true uh, and, and, and this is the truth for things like YouTube I mean why not just create something that's almost exactly like YouTube but doesn't have advertising and you just sort of you pay to to have an account there and then you can upload as much as you want and you can uh, and it's the same basic experience just without the advertising and so then they don't have to have the cheap they say the incentive to make you addicted to the platform But in some sense, I mean, the idea that the platform is going to make you make your attention feel sacred, that is, is more scary to me because that's a kind of, that's another level of mind control inception. It's better to have the obtuse mind control addiction that at least then people can, can wake up to than to have the system treating their attention as sacred. Because I'm, I'm, I really feel that that would most probably be an illusion. And it, it, it would be much simpler if, if people really understood the original Google um, ethos or, the, or the, 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 the motto, don't be evil, is, is don't have an evil character in, in your character. The, the character of Google, don't be evil, is not... It's not don't do evil, it's don't be evil. But this idea, see, don't be evil doesn't mean don't be, don't, doesn't mean be a good actor. It does, it's, it's not the same thing as be a good actor. It's don't be a bad actor. That's it. Don't be dishonest and deceptive in your own development and and manifestation of things and this idea that you're, you're trying to be a positive ethical force rather than just a transparent ethical force that isn't evil those are two different targets and the and any kind of positive target that is woven into a platform Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't want to, not everything that the interviewee said was problematic. I would say 40% of what he said, I think, was pretty much bunk. Um, and a kind of, a weird kind of diversion to play with this hypothetical game of how you're going to design a kind of utopian system of, of a platform, rather than allowing a platform to take on a particular characteristic. Um Anyway, so that's my basic thesis. Uh, okay, so this was my comments on a YouTube video, uh, which was a TED Talk.
in 2017, uh, the title of the TED Talk was, We're Building a Dystopia Just to Make People Click on Ads. And uh, I haven't just rewatched the video, but uh, so I'll probably mispronounce her name by Zeynep Tufika, to Tufeksi, Tufeksi. I, uh, sorry, my pronunciation is probably awful. So, um, and this is sort of directly answering some of the issues brought up in the video. So some of my comments it will probably seem slightly weird, but um, you can probably imagine the context to watch the video yourself. So, so this is my comment. Already within the fields of politics and social discourse, the themes brought up by this TED speaker are already emerging as subjects in their own right. And these are healthy developments that I'm thankful are coming to the forefront of the mainstream culture, only made possible by these kinds of exploitation. And the age of psychological politics is upon us, and only meditation on deeper issues of personality, character, and mind will offer keys to a brighter epoch that... Uh, uh, rather than languishing in the trenches of identity politics and the dreary effects of succumbing to the totalizing narrative of the demagogue, field marshals, rallying to the cause of their own style of cultism and identity. The monsters are wearing their masks, or, uh, the, the masks of their narrative slavery brazenly, and, living, and the living can witness their violence and vacuous weakness of character. Making decisions to progress into these lines... Uh, are overt because of the greater cultural transparency of the psychological tactics of, algor of algorithmic exploitation. Colon, Twitter has given a place to witness the corrupt hordes expressing their policing offered in the name of their ideological marshals, inflicting torment to feed the stability of their own identity narratives, externalizing any chance of self-criticism as a spiritless religion made into an obsession of history above the present conditions uh, and design of circumstance, choosing narrative progression above the pragmatism and progress for the living. Uh, okay, the second paragraph, which is hopefully more cogent. Uh, Transparency is already accomplished just by watching this, as in just by watching this video. Uh, I don't think unless people pay for a service, they can expect it to operate for their own interests. The only time we have ever gotten a taste of free media has been because of YouTube and Patreon supporting content creators and providing them a financial platform. In our culture, advertising in the field of publicity being made into a commodity has already been a troubling development that's legally very hard to structure as people and, and culture are hungry for celebrity or other forms of cultish, uh, cultish idealism. Plutocracy of the, of the algorithm is not fundamentally worrisome. If people are aware of its potential influence, which then forces people to elevate their awareness of the patterns that construct our lives and more clearly make a decision about understanding those patterns, these patterns are all the better to control people as they might. So there is a potential to transcend these forces rather than truncating systems so as to cover over people's vulnerabilities to become fated by their narrative or identity programming. Exploitation is a healthy precursor to developing an authentic self-determinism so long as the exploitation can be owned as missing accountability. By a continuing stream of self-criticism that is the ongoing story of free will and expanding liberty. So... I'm basically saying that it's good that we're being exploited and it's good that we that we suffer from the exploitation and if we are going to be exploited in a more subtle way in which our attention is treated as being sacred that that will be the more insidious form of undetectable exploitation. And in some sense I do also see that this how how the kind of problem that is framed by these people, in some sense, you know, it's the right problem to have. It's the right exploitation to have even. It's appropriate for where we are, sort of where, where we are socially and culturally and economically in some sense. That you can kind of already, I mean, generally my solution to this is to have functional independence, is to have a viable alternative in terms of culture. And that space needs to be, sought after by people who are interested in making it 
or, or forging it out of let's say the to turn away from from what we're currently experiencing in some sense and to try to sort of pad the the prison cells to to put the window dressing the lipstick on the pig is in my mind the much more nefarious sort of route to take um I mean, you know, as it's even, you know, if we didn't have this attention being gamed from us, then parts of the economy would perhaps crumble. Now, in some sense to me, this is a greater sort of, or a broader problem that, um, you know, we need an alternative system in some sense. And I, and I do think that if you try to sort of make, you know, I mean, maybe this is me sounding like an accelerationist, but in some sense, I think that the kind of problem that we have in the current setup is an authentic representation of the entire sort of lack of fidelity in the system itself, uh, the lack of integrity. And in some sense, it's the right problem to have, because then I don't think you, you can regulate integrity into a system. I think that people can diagnose that there's a certain level of integrity that's missing and then make a new platform, make a different platform, make a different service, make a different participatory engagement, make a different sort of community or a different model of provision of something to its members or to its uh, customers in which they are paying to not endure that that level of lack of integrity that in some sense I think that the real problem is is that there isn't a value in trust uh, th that people are not willing essentially to um, to fund integrity or uh, high trust structures in some sense they don't want to build them or they don't want to put the energy it does, it's not just fun, uh, f fund I mean that in a broader sense they don't want to put in the value and the energy into maintaining it they want it to be provided to them they want it to be automatic and that is actually the sort of the biggest tendency within people that means that essentially that they will need to be sheeple they will need to be treated and they fundamentally they will have to be exploited if they are not willing to provide that energy into developing uh, such a system or, or uh, uh, contributing to the maintenance of such a system, then they are demanding to be exploited. They are demanding to be programmed in some sense. And I, for one, would much rather the programming be um, dystopian than it be a kind of internal mirror of their of their kind of of their baser desires and kind of targeting some kind of healthy mix of some kind of, you know, some, some well-adjusted sheeple sort of outcome target that our algorithmic designers are, you know, in their, uh, are, are, are trying to target. So, yeah, I mean, I think that if this crisis of the mind in some sense was to be ameliorated in a lot of the way that is being outlined by the rebel wisdom interviewee then you've you've actually um it's probably going to divert the meta crisis into other quadrants it's going to and in some sense it's, it's going to confect the crisis into an insoluble sort of problem that the crisis of the mind and, and, and as it's manifesting here in some sense because uh yeah, and I think the model of a kind of ethical platform, in some sense, is is a fundamental problem. It's it's even it's it's a worse problem than the current problem th that we uh, are faced with, and at least the problem that we're currently faced with is a good, authentic problem. And in some sense, the problem, the only problem about this current problem is just that we haven't sat with it for long enough. I mean, we've, we've sat with it for some time, but, you know, it, it takes time for things to seep into the culture, for, the, for it to be manifested enough for it to be responded to in a kind of cultural digest, digestion. You know, 
there's always this point in history where when people don't know what's going on in the present until five years after the fact, essentially. It's very hard for some people to, to put their finger on what it was. You, uh, you need enough of a kind of context uh, before you can kind of make a judgment, a kind of uh, a solid reading and evaluation on it. You need enough sort of pattern recognition, enough experience with something for it to be uh, amenable for it to uh, for that ingredient to essentially be baked into a um, uh, into a robust and carefully confected um, product of 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 the mind uh, that 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 has enough sophistication of of texture to know all the elements that 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 uh, make up this this very complicated uh, um, output of, of, of self-awareness. Um, because, you know, and, and so, and having other people be ethical for us is going to really just confuse the whole issue very badly that other people should be more ethical instead of us is, is, is a, a way to, to disempower the agency and the self-determinism and, and the emergence of such. Um, I mean, I would say in some sense that most algorithms should strive to be agnostic in some sense in terms of how they treat content that are being processed by them. And if they're not going to be agnostic, if they are going to have sort of little tricky things in some sense, they should actually be a kind of disclaimer, that, that they should be a kind of... Um, and, I mean, th this this requires some sort of... I, I actually, I don't know if I uploaded it, but I had this sort of this philosophical argument with some people about machine learning. Um, and... The problem is, is that like when you use a lot of machine learning, that they use, they use a kind of, um, they're using heuristics in a kind of chaotic way in some sense, um, and in some sense, it's judged by its own outcome, and it and it has a kind of efficacy, and it's sort of trying to limit. Uh, uh, the the problem is is that even if you can reduce all of its mechanical parts into metaphors, and it's worthy to do so, it's worthy to reduce it into metaphors. Um, that when you that those metaphors have presumptions baked into them and they're actually uh, presumptions which are not um, they don't have an epistemological basis in some sense like they're generally good enough heuristics to get something usable but in some sense it's like um, I mean they have a lot of presumptions which are bullshit you know which like the the past is a perfect representation of um, of a kind of 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 a valid prediction um, that the past is a is a model of 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 uh, a valid model for predictability um i mean that's a sort of a trite sort of presumption but um that's my point is that um if you bake in all the caveats all the presumptions that the machine and and me, and and then metaphorically sort of create a um, a semantic expression of what the, of what the algorithm is doing. Um, I mean, it's, it's going to look very you know. It's the problem is is that it's fundamentally reductive, um, and I mean that that can be done. And at some point, they are mixing things and and then taking a kind of statistical reading of that mix and so it kind of convolutes things to such an extent that um, you would actually need to be quite 
quite clever to sort of to transcribe that into a kind of into a semantic expression um, with with uh, with a human syntax of 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 the of a of some human a grammar, but um, if you did that. You know, and you had to tell people that that th this is essentially the process that their feed is being populated by, and you had to kind of disclaim that. I mean, it would kind of be ridiculous to some extent, and and the fidelity of that would also be somewhat dubious because it would almost be an uh, that transcription would be a kind of artwork, but almost the, the attempt to kind of, to put it into human reasoning in some sense. I mean, well, you see, the, the problem is that algorithms themselves, they do pose this general dispersal of human evaluation and human reasoning. The idea is almost fundamentally that free will can be gamed and that uh, there are heuristics that are um, dependable uh, within certain, let's say, targets or purposes that the algorithm is actually serving. That essentially the, the algorithm is not serving a truth claim. It's just serving a functional goal that its inventor sort of, you know, drove towards. Now, if you, if you are a kind of, if you believe in a kind of epistemology in the same way that uh, in, in a similar epistemology to Foucault which I, I submit is, is exactly actually what what the functional reduction or th th at the end of the day that's what the rebel wisdom interviewee believes in he's he's actually he, he doesn't have a different epistemology to v Foucault um, and, and I, I mean that uh, I, I can tell that even without him talking about philosophy I can tell that just in terms of his treatment of, of these sophisticated, nuanced um, issues in terms of, I mean, they didn't talk about it explicitly, but in some sense, if you want to railroad the, uh, the, the free will, of, uh, you know, the kind of that we just need more speech or something like that, that it's more, I mean, I, okay, I guess I'm, perhaps I'm misreading it slightly, but in some sense, it seemed to me that he, it's not just that we need more free will, if that's what he was saying, that, that it's very good to, that we need a kind of free will absolutism, but then we need more than that. But that didn't even seem to me his tone in some sense. In some sense, he was saying, no, we do actually need to kind of have, uh, because people don't have enough attention, therefore, um, it's actually important that we... Uh, have some kind of censorious monitor to help us uh, channel our salience and that essentially the algorithm is always going to be channeling attention towards something and because it's always going to be directing attention towards something that like over a statistical kind of generalization um, it's making an ethical uh, It's it's uh, it's doing an ethical um, function in some sense, and in yeah, I mean, in in some sense, I think that um, that's because essentially you haven't done the kind of model that I've described at the start, which is the solution to all of this. If, if that if the if the service that's running this, let's just say this kind of thing, is Google, and Google has decided, well. I'm not going to actually try to be a positive ethical force, but I'm not, I'm trying to not be evil. Then what I would do to not be evil is that I would be transparent to the, to, to the, to the, to who I'm providing a service to. And I would tell them about my service so that it's sort of, so the ball is in their court. And I would not try to sort of, as long as I'm being fundamentally transparent, not dressing up the service that I'm providing as something that it isn't, something that's being secretly curated, something that is being curated according to to um, categories and and flagging things and ideological interpretation, which is um, 
fundamentally not a kind of agnostic cultural force, but is also a very sort of partisan political um, ethical uh, uh, corruption in some sense, in that it's, it's disrespecting the ethics of one's uh, of, of, one's, uh, of, of one's customers or, 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 or at least the people that you're providing a service to if they're not your customers, if the ad people are your customers and essentially your, your user base is just a kind of sheeple cattle that you don't respect, that you are in fact being evil to because you are um, minimizing their agency in some, in, in some kind of a priori expect, uh, you know, sort of... Um, you know, in some sense, I think it's it's the um, this kind of elitism and intelligentsia, in some sense, um, that is the characteristic of the kind of evil that we are at the most suffering from. Um, th that is the greater source of this kind of corruption. Um, now, the second sort of set of issues of that, uh, is there a kind of platform that could be devised in a, in a better way that promoted the sacredness of people's attention? That, is a, that I don't think is a kind of NGO function. That is the function of a startup. That is a function of a, of a competing platform, of an actual ca platform that is trying to spin its own brand and have its own characteristics. The idea that it, it's going to kind of work out a, a bit of software that can just be plugged into all the existing platforms in some sense, that's going to be fucking scary. Uh, and in some sense, it's you, how are you going to, you know, it's going to be exactly like, well, how do you define hate speech? It's that same sort of problem that, that, that Jordan Peterson, you know, articulates perfectly, um, uh, properly in terms of, you know, who are going to be the people that define hate speech in some sense. And and there are solutions to this, but sadly, like they're just not. They're not. Uh, uh, there are ways of navigating some of these tricky issues, but uh, they require a kind of ethical backbone which just doesn't exist within the corporate space to a large extent and also um, you know it wouldn't survive the current uh, trends of um, political cor uh, pol political correctness and so you know we can't have an actual stable edifice we can't have a stable cultural edifice um, and so li liberalism continues to, to be attacked, essentially, I mean, by, 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 I would even say, intellectuals like this, that in terms of how they speak about Alex Jones and how they, um, you know, uh, oh, I hope I'm wrong. I mean, but it seemed to me very clear that essentially it was like, oh, no, no, the solution is not free speech. Um, I actually, I think, I think just having essentially, uh, like, uh, a kind of free speech at absolutism on, on like YouTube would actually be the kind of um, would kind of be like the solution even with you know sort of let's say flagging certain channels as being undesirable or something like that because there are other ways of dissemination as long as the links will still work as long as you can still make you know sort of um, uh, 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 links to, to particular videos and those won't be under um, you know just because something is on YouTube doesn't mean that someone is going to uh, I mean, you know, some of this argument of the interviewee is just, it's just so sort of palpably strange. You know, oh, oh, I mean, because to me, it seems he was only suggesting that, no, we do need to remove things from platforms because, they, because people don't have enough attention. 
so we can't let it be diluted by low quality content so we will decide what is high quality content I mean it's it's uh, you know like you know that's that's infantilism you know I mean th th that's that kind of disgusting paternalism is is not um, You know, I mean, that's, I mean, I don't see how that's not just another sort of totalitarianism in disguise. Um, and to me, it, it, it then conveniently sort of conflates all these disgusting, you know, calling Alex Jones racist. I mean, it, it, I mean how convenient is this for, for, this, for, for this totalitarian worldview as far as I can see? Um, of, of you know, led by these bright intel intelligentsia types because they've got a more sophisticated nuanced view on, on, a, on epistemology I mean Now I've had a bit more time to sort of think about what I've listened to in the Rebel Wisdom interview. And yeah, I, I think it's even more nefarious than I originally framed it. Um, because essentially, whose arbitration is ever going to make the platform ethical enough or, or ethical to what, to what positive outcome? You know, like, what is the, going to be the target here? Except if you're going to be basically supplement for the substantive critical thinking of the audience in some sense. So it, it's, it's premised on subverting the development or, or, the, or the possibility that the audience can have a kind of critical thinking. That they can't ever realize that their attention is being gamed. You know this idea that that essentially that, that they would suffer from always just be being on some sort of treadmill or something like that and that they could never sort of self-reflect and essentially start to categorize the uh their judgment on 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 the quality of content and start to sort of discern between better content or worse content that that has to somehow be curated for them uh, because you know the, the 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 pernicious conspiracy theories that will proliferate and be so superficial can just delude them, and that they will never self reflect on the sort of this rat race that that they are uh, engaging in, that that they can't be uh, dignified to sort of to, to be responsible for that and to be responsible for their. Uh, a dilution of their own agency that no no it, it has to be catered for them to some positive target that would save them from that hell and what would that what would that savior of that w w how would that platform be so endowed to be ethically efficacious uh, and 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 provide this utility to other people that that we can sort of stomach that people are being censored that that we can stomach that that and, 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 and in some sense, I think that there is a, a very sort of conveniently sort of cherry picked framing of this issue. It's one thing to say that a platform is not going to amplify the, the reach that, that, that a particular user of the platform would have or, or a particular uh, message that, that could be uploaded to the platform. It's one thing to say that the platform should not enable you in, in, in expanding your reach, shouldn't amplify the reach that you might otherwise be able to garner with just, let's say, the use of a link, that you have a link to your video and internally on the platform that that link is not being broadcast or is not being suggested to, to other users. But then you, you could have your other means of developing 
dissemination or, or outreach or something like that. Now, in some sense, I don't think that a platform should... I mean, I think it would be ideal if a platform had a fundamentally agnostic mechanism for suggesting content to other users. I think that that, that, that would foster, let's say, a, a generally good ethos in which the chips let the chips fall where they may, let people develop in that kind of, in that level playing field, even if it is tended towards, you know, the race to the bottom of the brainstem or something like that. And let be, let people be responsible for not being hijacked on that level. And for perhaps, because I mean, I think the algorithm is actually more nuanced than these people give them credit for that in some sense, there might be some people who curate their, their own use of a platform so well that essentially when, when they get pulled together with other people and then they all like the same things that they like and maybe you'll find actually that the people that watch content like that, they actually end up being exposed to heterodox uh, um, views, that, that they actually have a kind of heterodox culture but they just have a kind of a low tolerance for bullshit. They have a low tolerance for, you know. So in some sense, you might find that there are actually some algorithmic groups of people that essentially have a high tolerance for heterodoxy and, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, the trick is, is can you join that pool of people? Can you, can you hook into the algorithm in which people realize that actually that, that, uh, that niche or that cultural interface or whatever, that perspective is a more healthy perspective, is, 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 is a more robust or vital uh, uh, exercise of agency in which it, it's more sort of self-edifying and, 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 and dignifying um, or something like that. The idea that, oh no, there, there are too many of these pockets which are, you know, these people chasing conspiracy theories. Well, maybe that is their fate. Maybe that is, their, their, they, that is how they have chosen to, to interface with, with culture and reality. You can't have a platform that is mediating reality for them in order to try to sort of sh shore them up in, in some sense or, or, or supplement their, their lack of development of, of character. You can't do that. It's not going to function. In some sense, I mean, you're just trying to go back to the old sort of traditional world in which everything must be made simple, too simple, in fact. And then we don't ever confront these inner demons. Because I think that all the only thing that has manifested on YouTube, in some sense, is people's weakness of character, which they always had. But because we lived in a simpler time, in some sense, this was papered over. This was not confronted. There was no record of this. Now there is a record of this. And I think in some sense, a little bit of advocacy on this issue is all that is needed. You don't need to tell people we need to change the platform. The platform needs to be more ethical. We just need to tell people, look, your attention is being gamed. That, that is enough. That, just, just broadcasting that message is enough, I think, to make this a morally neutral ground again. Um, and in some sense, the real risk is in imposing a kind of some somebody's vision of a positive ethical uh, uh, thing. Um, and again, I, I do think that it's clear that the interviewee on Rebel Wisdom has a kind of F Foucault... Um, philosophical reading of, of epistemology, and it really does show... Um, in, in his, what I might even say is a kind of sort of elitist intelligentsia sort of attitude to these issues. Um, and you can see essentially how, and, 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 and this comes in this, this comes confected in this kind of attitude that you're dealing with people that cannot that are so overpowered by the influence of their environment of the platform, that the platform is just so overpowering to them that they, that they can't reclaim their agency in the face of, of essentially of, of the, um, of their, of their surroundings that are conditioning them. 
you know it, it is a very and 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 if you bake that into let's say your so-called positive ethical response or i would rather call it a reaction because in some sense these people are seemingly uh, advocating for a kind of a strong reaction so that this problem gets baked into the platform rather than be allowed to organically culturally be uh, adapted to and and eventually digested by culture and hopefully transcended in some sense and to the extent to which that culture can't do that perhaps culture deserves to be exploited it deserves and hopefully it's suffering in that exploitation because then at least there will be some kind of measurable outcome between those who don't fall to this you know insidious you know kind of self-degradation and those that do and it will it will create a cultural output let's just say which will at least for younger generations which are usually always prone to picking up at least on some signifying you know each generation generally likes to uh, manifest a kind of subculture in which they take a kind of contrarian view and a skeptical glance at what's going on around them and at least then to 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 some young generation looking at this they will they will at least be able to 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 perhaps get a firmer judgment on um let's say the travesties the travesties that befall one when one is not um accountable and vigilant in terms of protecting one's own agency and self-determinism and relinquishing that to some kind of gatekeeper or some kind of um i mean i, I do think that the the biggest the bigger threat here is this kind of this moral authoritarianism that you can kind of institutionalize an external moral authority and that under the auspice of that sort of external moral authority that we will get a greater justice uh, manifest somehow uh how that picture is going to be rendered how that authority is is going to what that's going to be inculcated into that is always left as a sort of oh well that's a complicated uh question in some sense and that seems to me much too readily the question that is 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 being wished for uh, uh to be answered by the interviewee of on 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 on, on rebel wisdom um I must say this defect I actually have found this defect in thinking in having a kind of a positive narrative in some sense. I think Jonathan Haidt it's funny because this person's mentioned as being friends with Jonathan Haidt, but I think Jonathan Haidt suffers from I believe the same I want to call it a moral deficit in some sense. Jonathan Haidt has has wonderful insights and and he and he often often speaks very very cogently and and I don't want to sort of derail every contribution that he has made but in some of his deep psychological i mean this is perhaps more of a, 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 a i mean i i've 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 experienced or been exposed to some of his work is is more sort of his typologies psychology stuff and I mean, this perhaps has to do with the methodology of, 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 of how you engage in certain forms of, of typology. And it's, um, there's a kind of symbolism that's baked into this is a too much of a disparate sort of tangent um it, it, it's, it's too much to sort of tack onto this but um but it is philosophically a bit relevant but it's going to be too much i guess i'll try to touch on it but when you are I mean, it's somewhat relevant when you're talking about algorithms and groups of people and looking at things from a kind of systems top-down point of view. And you're looking at people being conditioned by a system or, or how they interact with the system and something, something like that. And then 
you, you help your algorithm along by identifying categories or groups of people, or statistically significant, you know, sort of conglomerations. And these things obviously aren't real. They're, they're basically, they're, they're functionally, they're fictions. Um, but they're useful fictions, uh, depending on what you want to do. And the problem is, is that when you're doing things with them, you really rob yourself in terms of this, there's, there's a broken thread of in, in terms of epistemology wh where you have basically relented into a kind of reductive symbolism or something like that. And that symbolism is, is got, let's say, premises or presumptions of generalizations being fundamentally real, which is a, is a fundamental claim that is, which is not true. It's fundamentally false. But you need you need in order to do anything useful with generalizations, you have to you have to bake that presumption into your thinking. And then when you're dealing with these entities, which are these these fictional categories and things like that, to sort of dress up what you're doing as being more significant than what it really is. Uh, and dress up your methodology as, as being sufficient or, or, or useful in, in some general sense, you end up reifying these categories um, but anyway pu pu putting the, that to one side and continuing the, the the thing is is that when you want to prove that people belong to these categories or not you have to create uh, even a kind of semantic symbolism, which which doesn't have any fidelity to anything in some sense, but you basically you have to create narratives and say, well, these people they sort of they belong in this narrative, or they they use this narrative, even if they don't use the narrative, even if the their thinking involves many a great deal many of elements in that narrative, but they don't know how they're actually relating to those elements. They're not interested in how they are relating to those elements. They're not interested in the actual, let's say, integrity of the computations that those elements are, are being related to. They're just looking at, um, are you using these mechanisms? Because if you're using these mechanisms, that means you you, you your mind functions in terms of that narrative. Now, that is not even true. But that is a kind of reductive projection which is being put onto people so that they can basically be pigeonholed and be part of, of other categories of or significant conglomerations. And once you start sort of, let's say, labeling people as having certain worldviews in this way, in which the actual component parts of their computational, you know, uh, um, thought processes are are basically um, are 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 just being matched in terms of well do your component parts contain these objects because these objects we know are easy to track and if you have these that set of objects you belong to that pantheon of of belief system or sorry, belief set, rather. You see, this is the problem, is that it doesn't diagnose belief systems, it diagnoses sets of belief, and it doesn't, it doesn't properly distinguish between those two things. It doesn't know the difference between a belief system and a belief set. And it, 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 and it basically uh, conflates the two as well. Now, Jonathan Haidt, I believe, has actually, he, he I don't know if he's, he's, if he's slightly refined his thinking, but, um, but I believe that he has, he has been, um, what's the word, let me think, um, guilty of this, of this uh, uh, sin, as it were, or, or this intellectual crime. <sighs> At least in his psychological sort of typology stuff. I, 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 I don't think this necessarily bleeds over, but I mean, he was trying to, at some point he was making a lot of political sort of commentary and things like that. And I mean, I think he's sort of, in terms of when he's usually talking about this in, in public and things like that, I've never really seen him say anything that I would consider to be egregious. I mean, he's making sort of 
you know, he's, he's making reasonably responsible general claims, which he has tried to back up with his academic work, which I have, I do take some issue with that academic work, but in, in so far that it's been watered down in terms of what he actually draws on from it, I think it's, it's fairly responsible in terms of how he presents it to the public. But um, anyway, psychology is a different matter, and my main focus is on uh, personality theory and 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 so that's that's just a particular obsession that I have um, now anyway I mean this is a horrible tangent but um, getting back to talking about the interview with rebel wisdom it's it is problematic uh, when this friend of Jonathan Haidt the interviewee on rebel wisdom essentially to me seems to me to to have that that same kind of consciousness, which I do consider to be a kind of, the kind of a poli it is the politicization of epistemology, um, and then how would you ever, how would you ever p police that, or let's say promote positive political? You know, it's it's just it's um, it's an insoluble confection, and in some sense. I mean, I've already, I think I've already given the only tools. I mean, yes, you could say that certain platforms could do a better job, that they could be sort of more sophisticated referral suggestions or something like that, that where you could break up, let's say, pure entertainment clickbait type comment, uh, type content that could be suggested to other people based on, let's say, its um, its kind of addictive qualities versus other other qualities which are, let's say, um, deeper and more profound, or something like that. But again, like if you made those available to people, it um, wouldn't be very meaningful, depending on how networks were tracked in terms of similar tastes and grouping people who seem to have similar kinds of of um, consumption of of, uh, of of similar sorts of, of content in some sense but um, anyway and another yeah this thing uh, the, what I'm about to say sh should be brought up a bit I mean in this sense there's nothing new in any of this stuff I mean this is like um, South Park season 19 which was how many years ago 2016 or something South Park season 16, oh, sorry, season 19. I mean, this is all South Park season 19 stuff. This is, this is old stuff. Um, and it's interesting because you can see how it's also married with the woke stuff quite badly. That this, the concern for fixing th this problem gets welded or or, or, or wedded to this kind of this ethical project that will always be headed by some kind of elite elitist you know sort of consciousness that needs to be um, I mean the, and again the displacement of a kind of organic cultural epistemology that develops even under certain pressures of being contained by you know certain platforms in some sense I think again, as long as those those platforms are relatively agnostic in in how they procedurally operate, uh, in terms of agnostic in terms of how they treat their content, I think that that is almost the ideal. Um, that there are either. There, there are even other ways of interfacing with these platforms. You know, you don't have to be, you don't have to immerse yourself into a platform in order to make use of it. You know, there are ways in which these things could be curated by other people. There are ways in which you know they could be embedded and 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 um, into other platforms in some sense that that portals could be curated or amassed or something like that. Uh, 
you know, in some sense, you know, this, this only is the kind of issue that it's being drawn out to be in the idea that like this platform is all there is. And when you're on this platform, it can't be augmented or, 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 um, filtered by by some other you know sort of project of somebody else employing their agency through another platform that augments the interface with with an with yet another platform and so the kind of you know the kind of the mix and match sort of the, the mixed interface which is something that, that that culture can develop and adapt if the platform itself isn't trying to be kind of the one-stop shop, or as long as it can't enforce itself to be the one-stop shop, I think it's better that they just st stick as the quality of what they are. They don't try to to become a kind of chameleon, or they don't try to sort of hide themselves or, or disguise what they're doing. Um, would Would probably be safer and allow for culture to eventually digest and hopefully transcend and to the extent that it doesn't digest and transcend then it it deserves to languish in whatever state that it subsists in trial by fire as they say um would be better than being frozen into some kind of narrative that is designed by someone that that allows me to to to, to unconsciously be imprinted on on some kind of strange target that lets me know that because I'm hitting that target from the design feature uh, of 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 the platform that that I sort of intrinsically must therefore attest that my my attention is now sacred or something like that. That that the platform has inculcated that within me, that that, that it has sort of endemically imprinted that in my in my values, supposedly. Like how you know, it it's sort of I mean that that's a good transition for people to make, but if they don't make it consciously, it's not even, it's 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 it's, it's not going to happen. It's 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 sort of, it, that's not what it is. If it's not if it's not a conscious exercise of agency, if it's done for one, by by the kind of paternalist infantilizing platform. Okay, now I'm just sort of repeating myself, but um. What's the other point? Uh, yeah, season 19 of South Park is really worth watching on, on exactly this, um, these issues. Uh, There is a greater psychological point to be made about these things. Um, yeah, it, it's a very sort of nuanced point and it, it's going to take a long time for me to kind of establish it in talking about it. But in in trauma, which and trauma is, is the basis of... of uh, what I'm going to say is slightly controversial. It's not that controversial. It has a lot of agreement by a lot of the, the, the leaders in the field 
of, of personality disorders. But trauma is, is really um, post what, what we believe is, as, as personality disorders are, are most probably post-traumatic manifestations. Um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder is probably the basis of pretty much everything we see in cluster B personality disorders. Now, there are, let's say, naturally occurring versions of this, and you get what I would consider to be ideological versions of personality disorder. And they propagate themselves by basically cultivating a culture of experiencing trauma. And essentially, what is called the ANP, the apparently normal part, and the EP, which is the emotional part, which is part of the internal dissociation, which, which um, is the post-traumatic sort of uh, uh, setup or, or complex that is, develops in order to, to, let's say, manage the issue of trauma that has, has been experienced. Now, the, the ANP, in some sense, okay, there are a lot of things about this, but um, I would say that the ANP, the apparently normal part, is like the kind of the analytical manager of, of, of a lot of things. And in some sense, I don't know, um, This is too much to get into, but I'm just going to summarize this. Um, but uh, the, the ideology of uh, uh, critical race theory, for instance, creates a kind of protective defense mechanism, which even by exercising it, invokes and induces more traumatic experience and projects more traumatic experiences um, onto its environment. And this then reinforces the defense mechanism even more. It, it self-aggrandizes it to some extent. And so it entrenches one deeper in the ideology. It, it inculcates one into it. It's kind of like a vicious... I mean, um, anyway... Uh, This, this in general is why I think talking about narratives has become such a, uh, an important touchstone for, for the current state of culture, why narrative is so central, is because it's a kind of relativistic moral relativism but, and, 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 a kind of, and a strange sort of external locus of control and essentially that external locus of control is only justified by sort of reifying this concept of a narrative and, and narrative as being supplementary, um, as in it, it completely displaces the notion of reality. That you don't have reality, you have a narrative. And everyone has their narrative. which then also has this kind of paradox as well, that, uh, that you need a kind of political mediator to, to help broker the problem with, with the gaps between, the distance between the different narratives, and that some narratives have been politically suppressed and oppressed, and they need a kind of objective compensation for this. And this kind of... This is a confusion because it's sort of it's it's uh, it's it's also sort of it's a paradox because it's sort of this moral relativism therefore gives itself the right to judge everything and where is it standing when it judges everything it's standing above the system beyond it somehow so somehow this moral relativism is also making universal claims you know it, it's sort of it, it's it's really strange but. Uh, there are psychological parallels to this. I mean, this is exactly what sort of a borderline is, is in fact doing when they are jumping around um, and unfolding and leveraging a narrative against other people, but 
you know, their feelings are always pure and objective and correct. Um, so anyway, the, 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 there's a kind of inculcation to pander to this kind of hybridized personality disorder, which is proliferating via this kind of ideology, which I, I see it as the kind of the ANP. The ideology is a kind of, is, is a group think ANP, apparently normal part. And in as much as that it has not been directly challenged, also because of the kind of the idea that, oh no, well, everyone needs, needs space, everyone, you know. Um, so if they're feeling persecuted, they can't have criticism levied against them. They can't be confronted. They can't be called out. Um, they can't be criticized. They are too vulnerable and, and there's a kind of this there's always the sense of necessity that is the thread that is leading the unfolding of the narrative um, Now, it's very problematic because if you are going to try to look at creating a positive ethical framework that is trying to be above the fray and is going to kind of take a kind of objective view of things. You see, this is the problem is that like you can't actually have a real ethics unless it is being contended from what I would call an epistemically responsibilist position. That if you are going to try to invoke some kind of epistemic uh, uh, conduciveness, you already are creating a rotten and corrupted system. And uh, this is this is probably content that the that the interviewee of Rebel Wisdom really actually needs to get into. You should read a paper called "Epistemic Agency" by Catherine Elgin um, of Harvard. Uh, she actually, I believe, her philosophical views are very cogent and are very good. I think she has some personal views which are disgustingly woke and which are dis which is in a, which is very strange because I think that she has very good critiques against epistemic conduciveness, but she, in her use of knowledge communities, have has basically entered into a, a, a very bad paradigm of epistemic conduciveness herself which she has somewhat found a way to excuse or or sort of uh anyway uh, this is a, this is hard to say so I'm, I'm saying you know she's got very good work but she has actually very disgusting sentiments which fall foul of her own philosophy so anyway i'm, I'm just pointing that out um And I've got some recordings that specifically go into that, why I think she's making those horrible mistakes. But anyway, um, there's also another uh, really good paper from, uh, from where I live, a local professor. Uh, she uh, wrote a chapter in a book on Nietzschean philosophy called Living with Nihilism, I think is the name of the book, or might be the name of her chapter, or anyway, but it's by Vasti Ruot, V-A-S-T-I, and Ruot, R-O-O-D-T, that's her name, and uh, Living with Nihilism, and that can also be downloaded off the internet, just searching that, but that, that, those, those two papers, uh, um, epistemic agency and uh, uh, living with nihilism those two papers I think will, will actually show the importance of epistemic responsibilism 
and that essentially agency is the only thing that infuses anything with, with an actual epistemic claim. And that we cannot take external authorities, even conglomerations of, a, of, of epistemic agents and call them organizations or groups. You cannot say that those groups inherit the epistemic agency of their members or participants, that they are involved. In. This is the problem that Catherine Elkin gets into, that she sort of, she, she sort of creates these sort of these meta institutions that inherit the agency of the, uh, that the participants are sort of functionally engaged in some activity. And then actually, I think that's even precipitating, again, something that's quite similar to, to a kind of Foucault kind of interpretation of, um, of, 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 a, of a kind of, of, of quite a disgusting and unjustifiable reduction, uh, re reductionist view of moral consideration being kind of conglomerated into a kind of incorporated external authority which then has to be dealt with um, against an individual which will always be outnumbered. Um, you know, somehow the quality gets, gets um, the quality of epistemic agency gets concentrated and um, the process of that concentration creates a kind of a political paradigm which, uh, you know, which you can sort of try to create some kind of strange mechanical calibration and, and monitoring system or planning thereof. And then you, you've actually, un, unbeknown, un, un, unwittingly, you've actually created that, that kind of, that, that weird paradox, that similar paradox in moral relativism, where, where, where are you judging the system from? You're judging it from the point of view of the organization, of the conglomeration itself. And you've completely lost sight of the individual participant. Which, in some sense, you, w w the presumption, the false presumption that's baked into this is that, like, somehow the organizations are all there are. And, and you can't, it's impossible to somewhat make new organizations or to, or to have someone who is is in a mix of, of more than, you know, as, as if these organizations are sort of mutually exclusive nations and that you can't have people that are members of multiple of them and sort of intersect them. You know, the kind of, the intersectionality of individualism has been essentially neutered in order just to create a stable organizational reductionist narrative. Which allows the concentration of the eff efficacy of epistemic agency to be transmuted into that narrative paradigm. And then you've got essentially a symbolic epistemic conduciveness that has just had as, as its origin story or as its kind of ontological description something that that involved the words epistemic responsibilism but it has been essentially lost it's been betrayed it's been diluted and for me it's quite i can't believe i mean i haven't heard catherine elgin talking about these points directly but to me this worldview is is implied in in the small comments that I've heard her make. Um, very what I would think is benighted the correct word. You know, just almost completely. I mean, I, I just see them as completely unjustifiable comments. You know, like uh, the idea that because you don't have equal numbers of representation, that means that there must be a problem. I mean, just how how obtuse can you really be about reality? Um, it's just utterly ridiculous. There's no excuse for such blatant nescience, such sort of overt, resentful, you know, sort of nitpicking and, you know, th that, that somehow raw numbers mean something, as if agency cannot account for these things, as if people just making choices based on their preferences isn't good enough that a relatively free and open society 
is not is just not good enough if people don't redirect their agency in order to measure up to some preconceived notion of 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 parity on some on some organizational structural obtuse level of some kind of epistemic conduciveness you know to, uh, you know that that's the kind of fake morality you get this kind of superficial morality you get when you start getting narratives involved then then essentially the narrative just gives you excuse to just basically trigger epistemic conduciveness and you've completely lost the plot you don't even realize how evil you are um how undermining you are of authentic human liberty anyway i'm going to stop this recording